This is Writers Not Writing, the show where you can get to know your favorite writers and soon-to-be favorite writers by listening to them confess to the ways they procrastinate. Thanks for procrastinating with us. I'm Benjamin Gorman, and the quiet guy behind the glass there is Doug the producer. I write novels and collections of poetry and stuff. Doug tries his best to make me sound better. And each week we have a secret word to listen for. If you catch it, you earn the right to take an extra break at the time of your choosing from whatever is stressing you out. From Not A Pipe Publishing, welcome to Writers Not Writing. Today's secret word is lumen. Yeah, lumen. That's good. Welcome, everyone. Today's guest is Jason Brick. Uh, Jason is a writer, a gamer, a headbanger, a traveler, a husband, and a dad, not necessarily in that order of importance. Welcome. Very glad to have you here today. Thank you for having me. This will be a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. It's always a kick. And uh, as everybody who watches the show knows, we always dress up in costumes like this. We go all out. We you know, want to make sure that our YouTube viewers are seeing us in our full regalia. Uh, but we have to explain what we're wearing for the folks who are on the podcast. So, Jason, tell everybody about the costume you chose to wear today. Well, my wife is out of town on a business trip for two weeks. So whenever she's out of town, I walk around in her clothes because I miss her so much. Yeah. So I'm in in my favorite of her LBDs and a pair of punishing heels. Yes, yes. Ooh, oh, yeah. You're holding up that foot there. Yes, those heels do look uh, unpleasant. Well, I, you know, I wanted to go with that same theme because I was trying to match the theme of the guest. But I don't know if my fiance, Crystal, would really want me wearing her clothes. So uh, she does love dressing up the dog. So I went with some of the dog's clothes. So we have a pit bull that's about my girth. Uh, and so I got one of the harness. It's blue denim and it's got these rainbow butterfly wings here. And then this rainbow tutu. And uh, then I've got the choke chain and then the leash has a lightsaber hilt because we're big giant nerds. Uh, and so I'm just wearing a, you know, a, a, some dog clothes and that's all. And it's a little, uh, it's a little chilly in here. Uh, it's a nice warm day. So that's made it not too bad to be just wearing a harness and a tutu. But I really am feeling like a pretty dog. Like I, I can see why Evie loves this so much. So, um, so let me get this straight. I'm in a cocktail dress and high heels, and there's a leash and a harness. That, I'm sensing a theme here. Yep, yep. I'm I trying hope we're not to, out of anybody. Know, I'm, I'm trying to lean into it. Like, that's yeah. if that's what we're going for today, that's what we're going for. So I'm not here to yuck anybody's yum. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, this is a show about procrastination, what we do as writers when we're not writing, because that's a lot more helpful to readers who are trying to get to know us. So uh, what have you been listening to? What's What's been pop culture that has been uh, getting your attention when you are not writing lately? So I'm still listening to a whole lot of Leo Morricoli. Are you familiar with him? I, I, because of you. So I, I, <laughs> I heard you talking about him and I was like, I have got to look this guy up. And oh my gosh, amazing. So He's much, so much fun. fun. Did, did you catch, he dropped a cover of Relax. Uh, I don't know if I saw Relax. I saw, um, yeah. what was that I saw this last week? He has a great cover of um, What is Love? Oh, yeah. And, uh, and then Don't You Forget About Me from uh, Breakfast Club. So yeah. good. Yeah, um, he's fantastic. Um, for, for listeners that didn't know, know about him, he's a Norwegian heavy metal artist who just drops a cover of some pop song every week. Uh, he's both... Uh, I just love what he does with the music. Plus he's an inspiration to me as a creative because he's got a Patreon account. He charges followers a dollar a song, a song drops a song a week. And he's got something like 7,000 followers right now. Yeah. So you run that math. Do, you, right. do we swear on this show? Uh, we can't because of YouTube. So podcast okay. that would have been fine. YouTube is prudes. All right. So he, uh, you know, he's making a quarter million a year uh, horsing around yes. on his guitar. Yeah, well, not just his guitar. This guy, one of yeah. the things that impressed me so much is he's playing everything. I mean, yeah. this guy is an amazing drummer, guitarist, bass player, singer. I'm like, wow, this guy has got a lot of, and he's mixing it all uh, there yeah. in his studio. So yeah, do check him out. And I'll post links to uh, to the, all those that we've mentioned uh, in, the, in the show notes there. But uh, yeah, he's really talented. And, and uh, I didn't catch that he was Norwegian though. You know, his, there's no particular accent where i'm like oh okay this is somebody you know doing he just sounds like a guy doing 80s tunes but turning them into these amazing <laughs> metal versions so, and not just the 80s his, his cover of um house of the rising sun is oh. just iconic okay i will and, find that one too yeah and since we're talking about metal i uh, i saw bloody wood over at the 
over at the Hollywood Theater about three weeks ago now. And it was those those gentlemen put on a show. Yeah, um, I saw this great video yesterday of this guy. And I can't even remember the, the it was uh, on TikTok mm-hmm. where uh, he says he's going to play a new song and the crowd boos because they mm-hmm. want him to play all the old hits. And then somebody yells out, play SpongeBob. And he starts doing kind of a very, you know, it's straight out of like, you know, the, the show version. And everybody in the audience starts singing along. And it was like. <laughs> The you know it's like this total like metal crowd singing the SpongeBob theme with him, and I was like that, and he was like, "You guys are idiots." And it was great. It was a, this great moment. It was like, "Oh yeah, like metalheads might dress in a way that people think they're scary, but they're a bunch of dorks, and it's really fun." Oh, yeah. like, Huge nerds. Huge yeah. nerds. Almost all of us. Yeah, uh, that was great. Yeah. So, what about news wise? What's been pulling your attention away from your writing from the news? Well, that's the thing with my writing, right? Because my main writing is on in the safety sphere. Yeah. Everything comes back to what I write about almost. Um, yeah, but so I have to think about of... the new book. I mean, the, 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 the newest book is uh, The Safest Family on the Block. Yeah. It is, you know, very specifically about how to keep your family safe. One of the things I loved about it, and I don't want to get into like process or anything, but uh, I love that it was like a realistic you know, it wasn't the overblown, like the, the thing you need to worry about is your child being abducted by a stranger, which almost never happens. It's like, here's the actual practical stuff you can be do, do to be prepared for real dangers that are actually things you should be worried about. And I thought that's a really important message for people to be getting is, you know, don't let somebody scare you into stranger danger fears. That's wildly unlikely. There are so many more things to worry about. Well, thank you. That's it. That was the purpose of the program. You know, I've worked in safety and security for a very long time, journalism for a very long time. And just human beings as a species are really good at solving problems, but not so great at identifying problems. Yeah, we do not have and, a good ability to assess threat like we yeah. you know, go news, straight to. And I think it yeah. makes sense. We go from, you know, we're, mm-hmm. we're from these species that were like, there's a saber tooth tiger. I'm not going to think about anything but the saber tooth tiger. And so all somebody yeah. has to do is say saber tooth tiger. And we're like, that is the only thing my attention goes to, even if saber tooth tiger is not the thing to be afraid of anymore. Yeah. And so all that stuff. And then the news and the media, I'm not one of those guys who's like, ah, darn media, but definitely their incentivization yes. is for, again, the big splashy things. Like even though, you know, school shootings, for example, are, they are a horrible tragedy. They are a sickness in our country and something should be done. And yet they are still so vanishingly small as a yes. risk that it's with, there are so many more things we should focus on. And that was what the book was about, where after three years and a hundred interviews with safety experts across the entire spectrum of anything you can think of, just, you know, 101 of the most important things we can do to keep our kids safe. Yeah. Well, and the thing that's so healthy about that is it then provides people who are seeing the, you know, the if it bleeds, it leads kind of media story with something to do. Because so often those stories are here's something to be afraid of. And all you can do is feel fear, which isn't yeah. productive. But this was this is 101 things you can actually do. Like this is what you can do to keep your family safe. And it's, you know, so I yeah, that uh, I but I can imagine you watching the news. You're simultaneously going this relates and also this is another if it bleeds it leads kind of story that's got to be frustrating i picked a huge fight uh this a couple months ago there was a show it's a reality show i'm blanking on the name right now but they've got seven or eight families with different parenting styles and they put them through various tests and see how the kids do like eating a new food at dinner in an unfamiliar restaurant we're talking like toddlers and four-year-olds And they did, a, they had an episode on Stranger Danger. And so I'm just right there. I'm keyboard warrior. So why are we still talking about Stranger hey. Danger when we've known for 20 years that that's not this? And you know, nothing came of it, but I picked the fight. Yeah. <laughs> it's Well, and it's worth pointing out to people. Like I, I point out to students, like notice what you're being told to be afraid of versus yeah. what is actually a danger. One of the things that I experience here a lot in my small town is folks have this skewed perception that big cities are incredibly dangerous and that they are safe by being in a small town. And I have to say <laughs> that every once in a while, you know, in a given year, the murder rate in Monmouth Independence is higher than New York City. And they're yeah. floored. They're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, if we have two murders, our murder rate is statistically higher than New York City. And they're like, that can't be true. Do the math. Like, yeah. 
being in a small town does not make you safer in many ways it makes you know we have kids killed in agriculture accidents that doesn't happen in downtown new york like you know and so the the the, the myths but you know as i point out to them nobody makes a tv show about uh you know procedural about crime that is two murders a year it would be a really boring show and so you have your procedural about somebody solving a, a murder every week and it creates the false impression that big cities are way more dangerous we just don't assess threat in a yeah. rational way yeah and that's uh i can grab it hole on that all day yeah but, yeah. but the book is there to kind of put that in perspective yeah um yeah. Uh, one example because we're right you know i don't know when folks are listening to this but we're recording this just before the start of june and this one comes up every year. We haven't had it yet in Oregon, but at some time in the next five or six weeks, there's going to be a news article about a baby left in the back of a car. Mm. And the baby's going to, and that baby will have passed. And that is horrible. Yeah. And what's going to follow on that is a news article where people are telling folks, hey, put your phone in the back of the car, put your briefcase in the back of the car so that you won't forget your kid. And then we'll see the snarky memes about put something important in the back of your car. Yeah. But here's the thing about all that, you know, it's we're, we're snarking a little bit at this poor at this poor son bitch whose child died in a tragic right. preventable accident. Overwhelmingly, the parent who does that is not some irresponsible drug addled piece of filth. Yeah. What that is overwhelmingly is a parent who isn't normally in charge of taking the kid to daycare who on that day has to for some reason. Uh, yeah. And autopilot is a thing. Right. I like to ask everybody listening right now, when was the last time you pulled in your driveway with no real memory of the trip from home or the grocery store or your family or friend's house to that driveway? Oh, I've totally done. I've done the thing where uh, I'm, I'm headed somewhere and I accidentally mm -hmm. drive to work. Yeah. Because driving to work is so, oh, it's it's early in the morning. This is where I mm -hmm. go. Oh, it's a weekend. Why am I going here? Oh, I didn't mean to, but I drove basically halfway to work because autopilot. Yeah. It's real thing. And that happens all the time. You know what the overwhelmingly when that tragedy happens, it's that situation. Yeah, and we all say, Oh, it couldn't happen to me, but yeah, it could happen to all of us. Sure. Well, and, and plus, so putting something pulled in, in a thousand directions. And you know, this yeah. is somebody who has, you know, got, uh, you know, two jobs and they are yeah. frazzled and struggling and, you know, things and with like infants and toddlers, happen. we're still sleep deprived. Yeah. And all of that. And so it's not putting something more important in the back. It's putting something automatic yeah. in the back. So you pull into the drive, into your parking space at work, you turn to the passenger seat to get your phone, your briefcase, you say, hey, hold on a second, where's my damn briefcase? And then you go, shit, excuse me, excuse me, YouTube. Yeah. Um, no, and it makes and total sense that then you'd go, I, you know, if I step out of the car and I make it into the place, I'm going to go, oh yeah, I need to check my, oh wait, I don't have my phone. Oh yeah, and, and it could become part of the habit too. Automatically, yeah. I'd plunk my phone in there and then that reminds me that's that's yeah. a really smart, you know, make that part of the autopilot. Exactly. And that's and just illustrates the whole point where there's a thing that happens and it's terrible. And there's a narrative that we've created about it. that's not true. Yeah. And in this case, it not only prevents us from taking a very simple action that can protect us from that 100 percent, but also makes us a little bit mean. Yep. Yep. Judgy of the person who's just experienced this horrible tragedy. <laughs> I, you know, but, but, and I think that's self-protection. It is easier yeah. for me to say, I would never do that. Then mm -hmm. what could I do to make myself not do that? You know, that yeah. takes action. It's easier to judge than to prevent. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good illustration of the way that we address safety in an unhealthy way. Like yeah. you know, my, my household has enough food and water for a couple weeks. It's not, you know, for 10 years, it's not to, you know, survive the rapture. It's, to, uh, you know, if the bridge goes out when the Juan de Fuca plate goes and there's no food or, you know, water, like just basic, you know, like earthquakes yeah. could happen here. We're due for one, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just and it, it's not good food. And some of that canned stuff, I'm sure, is expired. But mm -hmm. <laughs> if I had yeah. nothing, I would eat expired canned food. <laughs> like, yeah. And you just keep that, you know, the two weeks, three days, whatever, whatever for my house because you know i'm not really ready for the zombie apocalypse yeah. um but I'm not sure a, it's exactly two weeks either yeah yeah but like somewhere between five days and two weeks restoration of services in the event of a right. major catastrophe 
is what you're looking for. And I recognize really. not everybody has yeah. the space. You know, if yeah. you're in an apartment, you don't have the space for, you know, multiple days, but you're also probably living closer to a bodega or something if you're in a apartment, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. Whereas, you know, uh, in a house, yeah, mm-hmm. it's a chunk of, you know, it's a it's a it's like a bookshelf in the garage. And that's enough. Yeah. Like, it doesn't, you know. Yeah. And for folks who are space, you know, you're tight on space, uh, just keep your camping gear in the trunk. Yeah. First of all, it clears out a large bit of square footage from your house and then wherever you're driving you have food shelter water and heat yeah you got stuck (laughs) in the snow you're gonna be okay i mean people died in the snow in this state which is not a particularly Mm -hmm. snowy state but they're oh we're gonna go up to mount hood oh we got lost and you know yeah there was a horrible story about a family that got killed again vanishingly rare but it could have been prevented you know one funny thing about that we live here in oregon every couple years we hear about somebody not from oregon coming in here and dying on our nature you don't often hear of Oregonians going somewhere else and dying on their nature. Right. Because we have the Pacific and we have Mount Hood, both of which are actively malevolent. And we yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. People should. Well, and also, yeah, yeah, you know, we've got this kind of hiking nature culture. And yeah. so people who are probably going out to those places are also the kind of people who are going, I'm going to read a book or, you know, I'm, I'm going to go hiking with yeah. friends who know more about hiking. So there is a little bit of that, you know, there's, there's less of the, Oh, I'm just going on a vacation. I know nothing about the natural world. Yeah. Well, see, I think it's very much like, you know, if you somebody who grew up in gang territory will run away from the sound of gunfire, not go and look and see what's happening. When I was a kid in San Diego, we would, uh, uh, I I went to, my folks sent me to an inner city school in, uh, in San Diego and the kids who were the magnet, you know, bus riding kids from the burbs, when a car would backfire, we would, you know, all kind of go like this. And the kids who were from there knew the difference. That's not gunfire. That's a backfire of a car. Whereas when there was gunfire, they would drop. And we would be standing up going, wait, was that a car backfiring? Because we didn't, it was not our nature. (laughs) You know, we didn't know it. Yeah, Chappelle has has a great riff about that, but I can't I can't do it. But it's it's worth looking into. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's it's real. It's very real. Yeah. Like, wait, what's going on here? This is not what I am accustomed to. I wonder what is the suburban equivalent now that I think about it. What was the thing that I would have been, you know, uh, the, the the danger that I was more acclimated to than maybe there isn't a danger. Maybe I just knew like what's at the church church potluck that's to oh be- we can bullshit the PTA better than anybody <laughs> on the planet. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> how to how to how to navigate PTA meetings? Yes. Uh, yes. So uh, when you aren't actually writing, uh, mm-hmm. so you're not working on you know uh, the which when it comes mm-hmm. to the safety stuff, the news is part of the writing, right? It's all yeah you're taking it in. But when you're not doing that and you are saying, "I need a kind of brain break," what have you been uh, getting up to lately? Well, so um, I mentioned we've been talking heavy metal, and I love a mosh pit. Uh, but you know, I only get to do that every couple of months. You know, I turned 50 this year. Uh, I've got the, we've got this riff now about for Lord of the Rings fans in the audience, you know, the day may come when the strength of metal fails and I'm too old for the pit, but today is not this day. Yes. Right. But, um, you know, one of these days after a good concert, I'm going to wake up in the morning and feel like the tin man and just sitting there. Oil can, oil can. I, but, I love a good mosh pit if it is a good mosh pit. I, yeah. I, I think there are very distinct. I, I mm-hmm. think there is a mosh pit and there is what I call a jock pit. And the yeah. mosh, pit, mosh pit is we're all jumping up and down and kind of shouldering into each other. And that's mm-hmm. a blast. The jock pit is the guy who's like, I'm going to actively punch you so that I can express <laughs> that I want to be punched. And it's like, no, this the, you're, you're not getting the experience. We're supposed to be having this collective experience here, bouncing mm. into one another, not, you know, trying yeah. to harm one another. I, uh, I don't mind. I don't mind both. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> Yes, uh, those the, you know yeah. the folks watching on YouTube. Uh, you know, Jason is a martial artist and is in good shape. And the folks watching on YouTube can also see here in my dog harness and tutu. I am not the kind of person who likes being punched. Like that's not you know that's very much not me. Yeah, but it is. I actually, uh, when I was going to the University of Oregon, I took a class on folklore and wrote my final paper for that class, making the argument that a mosh pit is a species of folk dance. Oh yeah, and I stand by it. 
Yeah, no, that's a, I think that's a, that's a real viable theory. Yeah, it is our, I mean, it's, it's, it's of the people and it is this collective experience and yeah, it's a folk dance. That's a cool way of thinking about it. Yeah. I'm and you know, it's funny, most people react that way, but really serious metalheads and really serious academics, both of them don't, they, they, oh. they get almost offended by the concept. I, I wonder but, uh, what it would be there, have, uh, somebody who's made the, the counter argument, what is the counter argument? Oh, they don't count. Like metalheads, like I'm not. I'm not pussy. I don't, I don't want to be a dance. folk dancer. Well, right. that, that one I can see. You know, I, I want. Yeah. I don't want it to have that. But I, the academic side, like, well, you know, they just also there's still that misconception steps. that heavy metal is not cultural. Oh yeah. All right. But you know, I don't remember them at the time. But in the class, we you know we did like a two week unit on folk dance, and there were seven characteristics of a folk dance, and every single one, yeah, a good mosh pit check the boxes so um in shakespeare's day the kind of mm -hmm. dancing they would do there's all these references to you know going dancing romeo and juliet yeah. is super important and uh i was down at uh, uh down in ashland at the oregon shakespeare festival and they were talking about how you know the 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 uh the sexes were so divided mm -hmm. you know women were not allowed out of the house uh, you know if they were uh, you know upper class women uh it was very taliban-esque and so these dances were these opportunities to evaluate potential mates and the dances were all about expressing your virility and so a lot yeah. of the dance moves were just like jump as high as you can so you can show you're in good shape because you're you know <laughs> 40 and the person who is going to be considering marrying you is 15 you know and you want to show i'm not too old yet like and so a lot yeah. of the dance moves like we would look at it and we would go it kind of looks like a more organized mosh pit like it's a lot of leaping mm -hmm. you know huh. so yeah it's totally a folk dance yeah i you don't have to sell me yeah yeah <laughs> Okay, so I want to try something yeah. new because I've got you on right. and I know you are a DD and d person. So the whole yes. point of the show is for folks to get to know writers and then be able to say, mm -hmm. oh, I want to, you know, check out your work. And I think a great way to get to know somebody is to find out if you were a, if not, not playing d d where you want to, you know, play all the various characters. But if you yourself were a D&D &D character, what would be your race and class? Mm. So I play a lot of D and D, um, and I end up kind of being typecast. I think at this point, uh, you know, I'm I'm short, I'm broad, I drink a lot, and I'm smelly. So I'm going to go with dwarf. Okay, yes. And I play dwarf clerics a lot, mostly because nobody else wants to play a cleric. But I've also been accused of being paladin esque by more than one person. I could see that. Uh, yes. So I'll go with dwarf paladin. Dwarf pal, very clear sense of right and wrong, you know. And I can uh, sometimes uh, be a uh, jerk uh, about lawful it. Lawful good. Probably, <laughs> would you be lawful good? I, interestingly, I take those quizzes from time to time and I consistently test out at either chaotic good or lawful evil. Okay, lawful evil. A lawful evil dwarf paladin. <laughs> yes, I can see that. Okay, so now you've been ambushed. Mm -hmm. You're traveling alone. You're attacked by three just level one goblins. What do you do? So I either intimidate them into changing their ways or I sucker punch them. Sucker punch and them. And get one of the goblins and beat the other two goblins with the first goblin. Which is a power move. Like that yeah. says you should be very, very intimidated. If you've got other friends in the woods, I'm the guy who used one of you to beat up another two. Yes, I think yeah. that is that is very much the style. To, you get back to Ender's game, right? You don't win, want to win just that fight. You want to win all the other fights those people might consider. Yes, yes. It is, in the long run, the most more peaceful solution. Right, right, yes. The, okay, so the, uh, what is that, uh, mutually assured destruction strategy? <laughs> yes. uh, not so much mutual. That's true, in this case it's not. It's just a, a show of force. Yes, uh, what, assured the, destruction the, uh, is, a very, um, is a very good space to be in. What was the term for that in uh, in uh, Gulf War I? Uh, oh, shock and awe? Yes, shock and awe. Yes, shock and awe so that there will be no other fights, which we know worked really well because we never had Gulf War II. So yeah. it was remarkably <laughs> effective. Um, uh, that is, uh, yeah, that's great. Okay, so dwarf, now I'm, and viewers will remember this as well. You know, chaotic evil dwarf paladin who uses one goblin to beat the other two. Like, I think that's, mm -hmm. yeah, that that's, that's uh, excellent. Okay, we're going to go to our commercial break. When we come back, I'm going to ask you about what have you been daydreaming about lately? All right. This week's show is brought to you by Miko Azul's The Staff of Fire and Bone and its sequel, The Rod of Wind and Iron. In The Staff of Fire and Bone, half-demon Sedrin Varkaris is on the run. 
He survived among his father's people as an Askari, sequestered behind the castle walls for his own safety. The Askari people tolerated his existence until age 15, when his demonic powers manifested. Despite being the son of a powerful regent, the Askari hate and fear him. The Shaili, his demon mother's people, hunt him as an abomination that must be destroyed. Magic is forbidden in Askari Bar, and Cedrin's powers are uncontrolled. Death and destruction follow him as he grapples with learning to use his abilities with disastrous results. With no safe haven to hide him, and few to trust, Cedrin must overcome a millennium of prejudice to acquire the four sacred elemental stones from the different peoples of Moralia. He needs them to create a talisman that may unify the various peoples of his world against the great demon Laylor, whose banishment nears its end. With little hope of redemption or thwarting Laylor's plans, Cedrin and his companions take heroism to a shocking new level. The choices they make and sacrifices they endure push them further than they ever expected possible and the fate of all Moralians hangs in the balance. In The Rod of Wind and Iron, the adventure continues with more complicated challenges and higher stakes. Although Cedron has acquired Ration, the Staff of Fire and Bone, he knows it won't be enough to save his world from the ravages it faces. The Garanth army marches against the Ascari, slaughtering everyone in their path and raising fields and towns alike. Meanwhile, an indestructible horde created by dark magic bears down on the Shaili, intent on destroying all life in Moralia. Amidst the chaos and death, Cedrin and Senna Kral, the daughter of a notorious spy, become unwilling allies. Senna's goal is to restore her father's reputation and save her city from total annihilation. Cedrin's quest is to acquire the Lost Windstone of Yesmarantha, which is essential in creating the only weapon that could potentially challenge the great demon Laylor. Natural enemies, Senna and Cedron devise an uneasy and temporary truce in order to achieve their ends. Betrayal is inevitable. Trust is impossible. Hope and time are running out. Order your copies of The Staff of Fire and Bone and The Rod of Wind and Iron today. Authors, poets, playwrights, as some of you know, we participate in an annual fundraiser for the Alzheimer's Association called The Longest Day. On that day, people around the country and around the world do all kinds of things like walkathons and knitting and mountain climbing, and they ask their friends and families to make donations for their efforts to the Alzheimer's Association to support care for families and research to find a cure for Alzheimer's. I participated in a few walks and then said to myself, Self, you are mediocre at walking and do not have a bunch of awesome friends known for their walking ability, but you can write and know a whole lot of other writers. So back in 2018, Not A Pipe Publishing put together our first Writing Against the Darkness team, and we've been going strong ever since. Here's the ask. You can join our team with a few clicks. If you want to, you can buy a t-shirt for the fundraiser, but that's not required. Then you post to your social media a few times, asking your friends and family to pledge to support you. On Wednesday, June 21st, we all hop on a Zoom call together early in the morning to say hello, wish one another luck, and then we write from dawn until dusk, 5.24 a.m. to 9.04 p.m. here at My Latitude. It's a long day, but don't worry, you can take all the breaks you want. In fact, if a Wednesday doesn't fit into your work schedule, you can do your longest day on another day before or after. The Alzheimer's Association won't turn your donations away. At the end of the day, we share out our word count and total them up and see how many words the team has written in a day. And how badly John Dover, author of Once Upon a Fang in the West, has beaten us by every year. It's fun, productive, and raises money for a good cause. If you'd like to participate, there is a link in the show notes. We would love to have you on our team. So come join our Writing Against the Darkness team and write with us for a good cause. Thank you. And we're back. I'm here with Jason Brick. Uh, Jason, what have you been daydreaming about lately? So um, you might recall from back some time ago, uh, just before we met, uh, that I had well, had just returned from a year in Malaysia with my right. with my sons, and they were they turned five and fifteen while they were there. Uh, the oldest is now twenty three, so he's off on his own seeking his fortune. But we're going to go spend a year in Greece. Um, so cool! Starting in September, so that's that's mostly when I daydream have time to daydream. I'm doing the checklists and the planning around that. Have you been to Greece before? I've never been to Europe. I was in Greece just last summer. You are oh. going to, I've, I've been, let's say I've been to Greece three times now. It is oh, nice. amazing. So where will you be? Do you know? So we're looking at Crete. Oh, okay. 
Yes, uh, um, which will be a... cheaper than Athens. Yes. It is beautiful. Yeah. Um, yes, you're going to have an amazing experience. And yeah. what brought that about? What what made you think, hey, let's pop off to Greece for a year? So cast back your minds to the late 20th century uh, when I went and did the teaching English in Japan thing for a year. And while I was there, I met my first wife. We That didn't work out, but we met while they were... She's from Corvallis, and I'm here from Hillsborough. But we met over there when we were both teaching English. In in Yeah, in Japan. So it was like, oh, yeah. close enough. And it turns out not so much. Yeah, people <laughs> said it was meant to be. It was Japan, so we were certainly obligated. Right, yes. Um, <laughs> but uh, we came back and agreed that, you know, living abroad uh, makes you a better person. And yeah. so we wanted our kids to experience that. And that's why we went to spend time in Malaysia. And then the divorce is shortly after we got back. But um, our oldest, we've seen how much uh, he's a happier, better, more grounded, broader person because of that experience. But the youngest, you know, he was four and five years there. He doesn't remember a lot of it. And so uh, it's his turn. Yeah. Oh, and that's we so would, well. And your wife yeah. can work remote. I mean, she'll be working exactly. remotely. Yeah. She's a literary agent. So exactly. Yeah. My uh, ex-wife was uh, an ESL teacher. So she was uh, just able to get a, a job out there teaching ESL. Um, so yeah, and then we were looking at places and, you know, I've lived in Japan, I've lived in Malaysia, I've done Asia, I love Asia, but I've been to Asia. Yeah. And so we were looking at Europe and one of the kind of fun little coincidences of how my career path has gone is I know a lot of travel writers and I know a lot of bodyguards. Yeah. So I asked both of those populations, so if I want to spend a year in Greece, where, where should I go in terms of, you know, cost, safety, medical facilities, all of that. And Overwhelmingly, the responses were Portugal and Greece. Interesting. And Greece is more centrally located. Yeah, yeah. Well, and uh, yeah, I, I can see both of those are going to be your cheapest places to live in in you know yeah. Europe. Well, is the cheapest places that still have class one trauma centers? Yeah, I mean, you're not you know because I mean it would be cheaper to live in Turkey, but Turkey yeah. is NATO barely and uh, yeah. and and does have some political instability. Greece is more yeah. stable, but has gone through a real economic hit in the last yeah few years and so it's a cheap place to get in uh to that that is going to be such a great experience well i i totally agree about travel is broadens you know everyone's sense of the word world yeah. i mean they're just all these things you don't notice could be different until you travel mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, and, you know, I tell kids about this all the time. Like they, they, you know, you think that is the way everything is. No, it's yeah. an outlet doesn't have to look like that. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, little things, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, all those sides. So. One of the ones about Malaysia that was really weird for me, but I got used to it. It really illustrates it is that people touch other people's kids all the time over there, and it's normal. That's and it's perfect. normal, like strangers in restaurants would pick up my four-year-old child and like carry them around and that and that's for we are a community and that's okay yeah yeah, yeah. and kids are everybody's kids because everybody's responsibility but i'm um, out you know and that's very different here um, well and it goes back to our stranger danger stranger danger stranger danger yeah. more important to us than we are a community who takes care of one another like yeah we are individuals and you know yeah, yeah. That's, and, that and is, all that and it kind of was thrown into really stark relief for me because on the way to Malaysia, we were in the airport in line and a little girl, probably three, maybe four, the important part being shorter than the security cordon ribbon, yeah. <laughs> ran ahead of her parents and right under that ribbon. And just and so I, I I'm grabbing this child because, you know, clearly the parents can't do that. This is a totally appropriate time for an adult to grab somebody else's right. child that I. I remember very clearly doing so much with my body language, holding the child, you know, locked out right. elbow arm length, kind of indicating with my head that I'm with two other children. And yeah. so I'm here while I'm team parent. I'm not doing anything uncorrupt. I would only do this in an emergency, like, you know, right. all this. And then I, I'm, I'm in country less than three hours when some total stranger picks up my child and kisses right. him on the forehead. Yeah. That is well, and that's good for me to know. I'm going to be uh, so I'm I'm going the other direction. I was in Greece last summer, and then my dad. And this is very generous of him. Is taking my brother and I, just my dad, and my brother and I. So uh, nice. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, father son's trip to uh, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. Oh, are you you're going to Siem Reap? Uh, to where? Siem Reap is this is the city that is accreted around Angkor Wat. Oh, okay. Yes, absolutely. Yes, Angkor Wat is one of my bucket list places to see in my life i'm i'm so excited so seam reap is it is the town it's really? right next to the anchor watt beer is 50 cents a glass 
you can when I was there it was a hundred bucks to fire an RPG at a junked out car. <laughs> and you can end up in a whorehouse accidentally. Um, really? That yeah, could yeah. be considering my both mm-hmm. my father and my brother, uh, who uh, uh are not you know the kind of people I would actually love to see that. Like they would just be so shocked and appalled and you know, mm-hmm. like out of their element to be in a whorehouse would be hilarious <laughs> yeah it's yeah it's like hey, if hey, I, Dad, were a, I don't think we're in my the life you think we're in parties, yeah <laughs> if i were planning bachelor parties i would do see him rape well, no. I had a friend who was there and he said it is the least expensive place to be. Like he was like, yeah. I, I would get a hotel for 10 bucks a night. And what he would do mm-hmm. is rent a bike and then just go see Anger Watt all day yeah. and then yeah. come back. And, you know, yeah. and then he did it for like days because that's yeah. so huge uh, that he just. And there's a, a second it. ruin there called Anchor Tom, ah. which is, that's T-H-O-M. It's right there on site. And although it's not as grand and not as well restored, I found it more interesting. Oh, okay. So I'll see if I can kind of, and this is one of these very planned tours. So, you know, we'll have to see if they allow Mm -hmm. us to go. There's this other thing that I've heard is really cool. Can we go see that too? But uh, yeah, Anger Tom. Okay. Yeah. So on that, I mean, you can just imagine, I am just so excited. And uh, the, the, what I've been doing over the last uh, couple of books is I'll go visit a place and then that becomes Mm -hmm. a setting. So in yeah. the third in my series, I was not quite sure where it would be set. And then my dad made this offer and I was like, and that's where book is Asia. going to be. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So that's going to be really fun. I'll be taking notes. Yeah. Now, Southeast Asia, if you've got a travel bug, anybody, and you're not sure where to go, Southeast Asia is inexpensive. It is very safe. The food is next level. And it's really interesting culturally and very, very friendly. Yeah. Yeah, that's I'm I I am so excited about that trip. Uh, we did have to plan it, unfortunately, during mm. the school year because our mm. summer is monsoon season, and yeah. so they don't even offer tours during monsoon season. Mm. There's just no point. Like the places would be inaccessible. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that's a that's a different. You know, as an Oregonian, I'm like, it's rain. We can do rain. No, not this rain. You can't. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, that's good. Good to know. Uh, so yeah, we'll have to do it during the spring. But yeah, no, I am not. Yeah, the rain is one of the few things Gabriel clearly remembers. Members. You know, he was four and five there, but he'll talk about it. About, yeah, the rain was like like a shower. It was warm and you couldn't see. It was. Yeah, he, yeah. he remembered. He remembered Just, that. It made so much of a impression on him. Yeah. And I actually would like to see it, but I understand like, oh, we're on a tour, but everything's closed. <laughs> That's that yeah. Uh, yeah, that is very cool. Okay, so what uh, what do folks need to know about what's going on with you right now? We talked a little bit about it, but uh, announcements. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the project I'm working on right now is I've got the book out and I'm starting to release a few mini courses. Things like, you see the school shooting uh, thing and you want to know, how do I talk to my kid about this? And I've got a course about not not just how to talk to your kid about it, but how to talk to school staff about it, how to talk to the school board about it, so that you have the information you need to make a good plan. Uh, For example, school district that my kids go to, they have a plan for all the buildings. And that plan will work in the high school, which is built very much like a prison, has solid core steel doors with very small windows, and somebody in the room who's going to school on a college football scholarship the next year, right? right? That's a very, it it will work for that. The elementary school that my sons went to has giant glass patio doors on the exterior, and one of their walls is a plastic accordion folder. Yeah. The plan that works for that high school, which was the plan, is not the right plan. So we actually created another plan to talk to our kids about as soon as they were old enough to be able to physically do the plan, which is basically if that situation happens, open the sliding door and run home. We're a block and a half away. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, But ha- giving people the uh, ability to find out what they need to know about what the school's teaching their kids, assess accurately whether or not that's a good idea, and yeah. then talk to your kids about what to do. And how to, how, especially how to train kids up so that they can survive that without scaring the crap out of your kids. Yeah, that's, a, I, mm-hmm. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, speaking about my own school district. And this yeah. doesn't come back on me, but we are in a very similar situation. We have buildings mm-hmm. that are newer, that have been designed with this in mind, that are, you know, really smart buildings uh, that have, you know, one clear entrance and uh, only a mm-hmm. few exits that, you know, you have to watch out for being propped or whatever, but uh, everything's funneled through one space. Uh, that's yeah. where the office is. You know, I mean, they're designed in that way. And then we have a couple of schools. We've got one school 
where there was this fad of, hey, it's cool in California, so let's build schools like that in Oregon, where all the doors are exterior doors to every classroom, mm -hmm. and it's this open campus. And yeah. from a security perspective, it's a nightmare. And I know they're yeah. well aware of that, but how do you even design an effective plan when mm -hmm. the school was built so that everything is outside? And uh, yeah. yeah, it's a, you, you're right. You would need a distinct plan for that space. It cannot be the district plan. Um, yeah. Uh, and I don't know and if so, they have that, but I'm like, oh, that building would just be. And they, the other thing they would do when they would build these California schools, I mean, I really do think they were just taking the architectural plans. And oh, they were. That here. They, they exactly did that um, yeah. during the 60s and 70s in Oregon. They were literally just buying the plans from California to yeah. save money on the construction. And they're flat roofs. Yeah. And so sure enough, they the, the ceilings leak. And then we yeah. get mold and it's like, who thought it was a good idea to build a flat roofed building in a place where it rains all winter long? Like it is, <laughs> they are terrible designs. And I'm like, mm -hmm. how much more would it have cost to even create a slight grade? And, you know, but yeah. the, you know, uh, the question, what were they thinking makes an unjustified yes. assumption. Yes, exactly. Uh, it's optimistic. Somebody, somebody came but, in and said, yeah. the, the group higher than us has said, this is the way to do it. So yeah. we will, you know, and. Yeah. yeah. So we, we see that anyway, that's one there. of the classes I'm I'm putting I'm putting out. It's out now. I've got another one on uh you congratulations, your kid just graduated. Uh let's talk about how we can train them to be safe in college. How can we do um in uh close protection circles they call it an advance, which is you go analyze a destination for travel for safety and come up with a plan and yeah. walk people through how to do that for their kids uh yeah. on campus. And that's everything I... from Find out if the uh, if campus security is a uh, private security force there, if it's being subcontracted out, if it's part of the local law enforcement, or if it's like it was at U of O when I went there, literally one of the work study jobs. Yeah. And yeah. find that out. Take a look at access to the dorm room. Uh, how do they control access to the dorms? How carefully is that watched? All the way to, well, if your kid's on, in a second floor dorm room, here's the, here's the model of fire ladder you should buy and have them stick under their bunk. That's really smart. My, uh, I've got a, a 18 year old who's going off to college this next mm -hmm. year. And yeah, doing some planning around that is, uh, makes a lot of good sense. So I, I yeah. will absolutely be checking that one out. That's really uh, smart. So yeah, you're going to just keep rolling out, you know, as many. Of yeah, those. I've got, the, I've been requested to do one about travel safety and, oh, yeah. so, and that's dovetailing with my trip anyway. So nice. that, yeah. and then, you know, there's so many topics. Uh, one of the other big ones I'm, I'm, I can't say who I'm collaborating with it on it yet, but um, it's somebody that people in the safety sphere will recognize the name, but it's talking about how to teach our teenagers how to spot an abuser. Mm, yes, watching that. The, the real grooming, not the people who are being accused of grooming. Yeah. Uh, but the actual, yeah, that's, we, we, we do work on that in, uh, in schools, certainly, you know, yeah. how do we identify those? But a lot of that is, uh, kind of perversely, uh, you know, how do we uh, tell teachers these are the things not to do, right? Yeah. Because the, you know, the, the grooming behaviors, but when you're saying these are the things not to do, you're accidentally saying, because this is how groomers would do it. It's almost like a how-to class, like, yeah. you know, but you have to express that so you can say, so that you're not falsely accused, don't fall into these early patterns because these folks are you know, smart and gross about what they do and they do it in a systematic way. And so yeah. teaching parents to watch for those early warning signs is really smart. Yeah. And it's uh, and one of the tricky things is, is as soon as somebody releases a, a class or a book on that, some groomer, some, some dirtbag is out there reading that right. and adjusting their approach. But yeah. there are some, there are a handful of behaviors that are warning signs and a handful of behaviors that are, Oh, Oh yeah. Okay. And what's even worse is that some of the very earliest signs, you know, two of the big ones are not respecting stated boundaries. Mm. That's one of the big ones. And oh, there's another one. I'm forgetting uh, it right now. Secrets. Yeah, secret, secrets is one of the really, that's that's when you know there's trouble. Yep. But like not yeah. respecting stated boundaries is something that abusers do. It's part of the interview to see if you're easy to abuse. It is also, however, something that good teachers, counselors, and coaches do. Yeah. <laughs> Because part of their job is to help you see with some boundaries that are not that that are illusory and are in the way. Yeah. Oh, and the other one is I'm separating you from your resources. Yeah. Right. Where, where that's a huge warning flag, but also a caring friend, a good coach, a good mentor will maybe say to you, that person is poisonous. Right. 
you need to step away from that. That but job is killing not you. Say only so only hang out yeah. with you. like that's exactly. the you know. But and the, determining the difference is tricky. Yeah, but I know the secrets doable. one is a should be a, yeah. that's one we can teach kids is a huge red flag. When yeah. somebody is selling, telling you don't tell this to anybody, like we need kids yeah. right away to go danger. Like that's yeah. a bad person. Like, you know. Well, even that becomes a little bit of a problem, right? Like some of the legislation, the legislation designed to protect trans youth includes yeah, not telling their parents. Right. But it's not, I mean, we're, I'm really upset <laughs> yeah. with kids about, well, I yeah. do this thing in my class where it's, you know, identify, you know, how, yeah. to let me know how you identify mm -hmm. and also let me know who I can tell. And yeah. the question's not, and let me know no control. one. So yeah. that they're in control and they can say, mm -hmm. my friends can know, my, the people in this classroom can know, okay. please use those pronouns in this class. My, I'm, I've had kids say this parent and not that parent. Yeah. And the, the big difference there is that you, as the teacher, as the person with the power and authority, are not saying to them, keep, keep the secret. You're saying, secret I will respect me. the secret you requested. Right, right. Because, yeah, yeah. And, and and I'm also have mm -hmm. to be really upfront with kids, you know, because they write essays about personal yeah. experiences or whatever, about here are secrets I will not keep for you. Like, if yeah. a kid tells me they are going to harm themselves, I'm like, you need to know I am a mandatory reporter. So before you write that down, be very aware that and yeah. kids then i mean that that's actually helpful to them they're like oh now i am gonna write that and i'm like oh great thanks for enlisting me but they needed an outlet like yeah, they needed exactly. somebody to get you know so yeah we take that very very seriously um oh yeah that's that's really and that's helpful to parents to know mm -hmm. yeah you know how to how to engage in the same way that teachers ought to engage yeah. <laughs> which is and then know, the the other side of that is as well that you know this applies lifelong you know when our kids yeah. are in grade school and, and middle school we're looking at the coaches the teachers the pastors um and then we're using the same checklist for the boyfriends and the girlfriends yeah yeah that's a good call because the, the uh that abuser that abuser personality the abuser playbook runs the same for yeah you know, pedophiles as it does for adult domestic abusers. Yeah, keep people away. I've, I've uh, a couple of friends who are uh, activists, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who are yeah. former victims of uh, of domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they will say is, oh, yeah, you know, people being cut off from their friends mm -hmm. and yeah. then, you know, being totally isolated is part of the plan. Yeah, uh, which you cut is them really off from the resources and so they're completely yeah. dependent upon you. You use, you know, there's, there's a whole playbook and yeah. it's... Ugh. Yeah, it is. It is. Sorry to bring down the tone of the show. No, but I mean that's it's good protecting... stuff for people to be thoughtful. Yeah. About, you know, like yeah. this is so this is something to you know have on people's radar so that they're going, oh yeah, yeah that's something to be you know mm -hmm. concerned about. So yeah, I'm, I'm I'm glad you're doing those courses and uh, yeah. and where can folks find those? So if you just go to my website, Safest Family on the Block, they're starting to populate up there. I'm I'm just now building the infrastructure for most of those. Uh, Find me on Facebook, um, Jason Brick. I think there's two or three of us, but I'm the only one that talks about martial arts and D&D. &D. Um, <laughs> and then yeah. Safest Family on the Blocks also on Instagram. You can find me. And anybody who's listening to this show, I'll I'll come up with some kind of discount for anybody on this show. Oh, very cool. Okay. Well, we'll put those links uh, in the uh, in yeah. the show notes. Yeah. Too. We'll get that all, all squared away. Uh, and in the meantime, if you are interested, especially in preparing a girl or woman that you care about for spotting and avoiding domestic abuse there's a book by a woman named kelly sayre s-a-y-r-e called sharp women that sure, is the smartest that. guide i've read okay with, with the caveat that i am a large white straight male with an athletic background and a bit of a fighting history i have a limited degree of um permission to tell women what they should read about their self-defense because my context and experience is clearly not theirs yeah. but um from my perspective and context this is the book it's the book that taught me much of what i is how i found out how wrong i was about a lot of the assumptions i make and about applying yeah. my context to a woman's context yeah, um, and there, and there's a lot of that phenomena going on yeah, of, yeah. oh, if, you know, if women would just do X, mm -hmm. Y, and Z, coming from either men or women who are not in that situation and don't yeah. uh, actually understand, yeah. you know, and are not doing the homework, doing the research. So, yeah, yeah that's I, I, I've, I've been calling that the contest gap. And the clear example is the high school quarterback who joined the army and is now a cop and is 6'5 and weighs 230. 
and is telling women what to do if they're physically attacked. Right. Right. Just do this. Yeah. His heart's in the right place. He means well. Right. (laughs) Right. Or uh, a guy kind of pokes some fun at a dude named Clint Emerson. He's a Navy SEAL who does some uh, family safety kind of advice. But for example, he did this video about, okay, here's what you do. You get one of those shoe racks that you put in the, that you put in your closet when you owned an apartment and you put your mace in one, you put your gun in another and some ammo in a third one and a knife here and some zip ties here and you hang it on the back of your front door. Yeah. It's like, God bless you. Thank yeah. you for your service. I'm not doing that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Neither that's... is anybody on my kid's soccer team. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Please, please don't. Yeah. That's a <laughs> terrible idea. Well, another right. thing that it leads to is some of this is, mm-hmm. you know, really healthy. Like here are things you can do, but yeah. it can get to victim blaming. Mm-hmm. So you can get yeah. to that. Well, you know, if you'd only done this, 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 and this, and it's like, no, but some mm-hmm. people get, they freeze. And yeah. there's nothing they could do in that moment. Mm-hmm. And that's legitimate. And we just need to acknowledge, like, the fault yeah. is the abusers, not the person who froze. Yeah. You know. And that's a very difficult thing, right? Because on the one hand, the fault is at the is the abusers, not the abused. Yeah. And this can be an illustrative case to help other people others. not be victimized. Yeah. So we are not and, shaming you. Yeah. And also, what can others learn from this? And that's exactly. really tough. Yeah. It, and it really can be tough. And uh, there's a show, oh, I'm forgetting its name, that a friend of mine is on. And it's basically, they show CCTV of crimes. And this guy who was a, he was a federal air marshal. And he's a dad with, I think it's two daughters and one son. He's got a series of books on um, so on situational awareness, especially. And he just kind of, you know, runs the color commentary, like a sports commentator yeah. on the video. And it does this is a very good guy. You know, he's a good man. And the, the host is a good woman. They are not victim blaming, but I could see how somebody could smell victim blaming coming off of that. If they didn't, even if they just didn't know them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And didn't know yeah. the purpose of this is not to say this person did something wrong in this case, yeah. but mm-hmm. this is what you could learn to do differently. And that's yeah. gotta be so that's, you know, yeah, that, that's, that's a, that's yeah. a fine line to walk. Exactly. Especially when you think there's a there's a phrase that's used a lot in security circles about self-defense training, which is we don't rise to the occasion. That's not how human psychology and human physiology work. We fall to our level of training. Mm, I like that a lot. Yeah, I, I don't like that. It's true. Right. But yeah, no, it is but very it's, true. Yeah, that's yeah, that that's... those fantasies that we often have when we think about somebody you got about. Well, I would have. Well, I I hear a lot of that in the kind of gun culture is if I had a gun, I would do the following. No, if you had a gun, you, you know, very possibly not load it in the moment because you'd be shaking. Like you'd shoot yourself in the foot. That actually happens. Like, you know. Yeah, I'll put it this way. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not anti 2A by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Whether or not there are firearms in my house, I'm going to leave as a surprise for anybody who tries to come in without permission. Um. However, if you are considering owning a gun for self-defense, think back to the last time you tried to take a picture with your phone under some kind of time pressure. Yeah. Yeah. And how did that go for you? Well, and, and this is speaks to one of the points that I will make to folks when I'm you know, kind of arguing about this is if you have a gun in your home, you are not more safe. You are less safe. Yeah. And, you know, the, the stats back that up in the same way that living in a big city is actually often, depending on yeah. the city, but living in a big city is safer. Not having a gun in your home is statistically safer. So unless you, you know, the, the, this is that not being able to assess threats yeah. where people are, you know, if you want to have a gun in your home, you need to treat it like, I recognize this makes me less safe. Mm-hmm. What do I need to do to make mm-hmm. sure I am not going to be harmed by my own firearm. My children are not going to be far, uh, harmed by my firearm. I'm getting the kind of training necessary yeah. to uh, use that safely. Because if it's just, I put a gun in my house, so I'm safer. No, you've made your house less safe for you and yeah. your own family. You know, A good rule of thumb for the, the people hero, I trust the most. You won't be the hero. Yeah. Your kid's going to shoot you, or you're going to yeah. shoot your kid, or your kid's going to shoot a friend. Like You've introduced this incredibly dangerous tool into your home. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's... My house is more dangerous because I have a table saw. Right. But also I, I train with it. Um, yes. A good rule of thumb from the, the gun people that I trust is if you're considering having a firearm, you must you have to commit and have the time and, and the money given ammo prices yeah. to put a thousand rounds downrange with your weapon every month and train 
and practice deploying it from the safe, from your purse, yep. from your holster, whatever it is. A thousand rounds every month. And if you have the time and the money and the interest and the discipline to do that, then perhaps it is a good idea. Right. And until then, it is not a self-defense weapon. Until then, yeah. it is something that stays locked up in the safe. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you needed a you know self-defense weapon in that moment, that's not the thing you reach for because you yeah. haven't done the work yet and you're going to actually make yourself less safe. That is a thing you have mm -hmm. where it's a toy. Like some people, you know, this is this thing that you are playing with. Some people it's for hunting. Some people it's because they're in the process of doing that training. But until mm -hmm. you're there, it is not yeah. your self-defense weapon yet. You're not ready, you know? And, and I think that's a, I think that's mm -hmm. a hard thing. I think people, you know, are like, I feel unsafe. I will get a gun. No, yeah. the day you got a gun, you did not make yourself more safe. You yeah. made yourself less safe until you're ready. So I just did a uh, an episode of my podcast with a firearms instructor down in Texas, and the title he went for was "The Myth of Carry," the myth of concealed carry and open carry, which is exactly what he was addressing there. Um, for for a self defense weapon, what I really recommend for anybody who's not you know into training is for 15 bucks, you can get a high lumen flashlight from Amazon. And when I say high lumen, I mean the model I have, again, $15. When we lost our cat a couple of years ago, we were walking around, it's flashing around, and I could see it reflecting off of a sign. And I went back, because I was curious, looked at the maps.com. It was a quarter mile away from me. Yeah, those, those are amazing. I've seen images of what they can how bright yeah. they are and they're yeah. really bright. So you then imagine you're in your bedroom at night and you notice somebody's in there and it's dark and you flash them with that and that will dazzle them enough for you to get out of the room, for you to grab the baseball bat, for whatever. And if it's your teenager, <laughs> yeah, you have not done anything other than annoy them. Yes, you haven't accidentally and, killed anyone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, And if as often happens when a good guy tries to deploy a weapon against a bad guy who has more experience with violence, even if they take that away, they're going to have to get awful creative to do something really bad to you with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, it is the, it is a self-defense weapon that I recommend for people who do not have that time and luxury and money to go spend the time you need to spend to yeah. become proficient with a weapon. That's really smart. I'd never heard that before. And I like that a lot. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the damage you have done is minor mm -hmm. retinal damage that will heal in about five minutes. But, yeah. Um, but but you know. for they are functionally blind yeah. for a minute or so, which is long enough for if you can escape and if you can't to really ruin their day. Right. But, uh, but, but, you know, and then to yeah. have the training of uh, my mm -hmm. first, in, you know, instinct should be to escape. Right. Yeah. It is not, oh, this person seems dazzled. I'm going to go engage them in hand to hand combat unless I'm trained to do so. Like first, mm -hmm. get out. You yeah. are more valuable than your stuff. You are yes. more valuable than your victory. Get out of that yeah. house. If you can't, then you, you know, and, and so training people mm -hmm. even that much to think, yeah, this is a way to dazzle somebody and run out of the room. Like that's exactly. really smart. And that's yeah. all it is. And, you know, my, the, our home invasion plan is identical to our fire plan. We live in a one-story sprawling ranch with three patio doors and two other doors. It is a tactically porous environment. Um, yeah. Bad guy comes in one side, we just go out the other. Yeah. And then we call yeah. the cops. Nothing in the house right. is more valuable than you. Run. Yeah. Like, yeah. Let alone my kids. And then, you know, then you get into legal stuff. And another thing that a lot of, you know, you get a lot of these fantasies about putting on them. But do you really want your child to see you maim somebody? Right. Right. Uh, Sherman Alexi wrote this really wonderful uh, short story mm -hmm. that's always stuck with me about this character who is, yeah. uh, you know, a white man and he, uh, uh, you know, some, uh, a, a teenage black boy sneaks into his house mm -hmm. and he, in his moment of heroism, hits him with a baseball bat. And I believe if I'm writing the story right, either either kills him or, you know, uh, you know, and, and then all the blowback that he has to deal with and realizing I, I, I could have just left. Like I didn't need to defeat this kid. And now I'm a white man who killed a black child. Yeah. Like what, what's the victory there? You know? Yeah. And, and it's, yeah, it's a really, 
haunting story. And then I think there's another layer because he's white presenting, but I don't believe he, I, I think he's native and he's, you know, and so he's, he's going through this, like, what is my, you know, why am I not be, you know, getting, getting kind of the benefit of the doubt because of my identity and the way this child was. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a really messy, messy story, but I mean, the, you know, the, the lesson that I think we can all take from it is don't try and be a hero, leave. You can yeah. leave. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And you get that that vibe when you're when you work with one of the things that's been great about my show because I am interviewing a lot of safety experts and that does include nutritionists, psychologists, um, educators, but it also includes a lot of people who are very very good in violence. And universally, they are the chillest, yeah, least likely to want to get into a tussle. Pe people that are in the room, yeah, because they're they're over the hero complex, yeah. They, yeah. they, they, you know, they, they, they dealt with that in their uh, first, uh, you know, whatever, six months of uh, <laughs> in yeah. Taekwondo or whatever, and then went, no, that's not the point. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, the responses. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also they've yeah. been hit before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, not and they probably fun. lost enough fights to know you can do yeah. everything right. And, you know, sometimes you slip a little. Sometimes you, I mean, it's yeah. so fast in an actual fight that it's not, I'm the cool hero like the movies. You know, yeah. I, that's one of those things that I, I think we, even mm -hmm. as writers, kind of accidentally reinforce a lot of times yeah. the hero wins. Yeah. The hero can slip on a rock. Like, you know, the, yeah. it, it, the little things can happen. And so if you can avoid that fight, uh, you're a lot better off than, you know, yeah, because I have magical, mystical powers, I will always mm -hmm. win. And, you know, and, and a heart of gold, I will win. Like, that's not the, the stories we present don't show, hey, that it, go, it, go, it goes real fast. <laughs> yeah. But nobody's yeah. going to pay 12 bucks to go to a movie with Jason Statham buckling his seatbelt and driving sedately away. Right, that's very true. <laughs> but uh, uh, um, there they did make a, a version mm -hmm. of the Iliad, uh, with uh, Brad Pitt and uh, Eric Bana, and Eric Bana in this intense fight mm -hmm. scene, literally trips on a rock. That's why yeah. Hector loses. And I was like, good. It is important for people to see the the character who is the most laudable. Hector is by far the most likable character in it. Yeah, he loses not because he's not a good fighter, not because he's not tough, not because he's not cool. He trips on a rock. Like, yeah. that's part of the shame of homer and i'm like let's tell this or you know the the tragedy yeah. that Homer's pointing out to us let's <laughs> tell that story more and then i have to go we have been telling it for 2800 years yeah we are pretty good <laughs> at telling that one but like that's a story we should include in our hero myths more often like, yeah hector die he trips on a rock like you yeah. know and that stuff happens yeah, yeah. um so uh what have you been when you are not doing your own writing? What have you been? What's in your to read pile right now? What's what, what so, are you looking forward to reading? So I just finished Hench. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the lady who wrote it, but it is uh that. so it the conceit is that the our protagonist w works through a temp agency that gets IT people to supervillains. Oh yes, so it's the henchman. Yes, oh that's yeah, awesome. and it's it's very fun and it kind of her situation escalates, and she ends up doing things like data mining to figure out which superheroes are cheating on their wives, because you can't shoot Superman, but you can get him really upset. Yeah, and get him to like lose his temper at a press <laughs> at a press release. Yes, press, oh, oh that's not awesome. Release, but a press meeting. Um. I'm in the middle right now of uh, Zero Boxer by Fonda Lee, which is just a, it's a martial arts sports science fiction book. I uh, just finished uh, the, her Jade, uh, what's the, um, uh, Jade City. Uh, oh yeah, the trilogy. The Greenbone trilogy. Oh my yeah. gosh, it's so, have you read those yet? A while back, but yeah. Oh, so good. I was uh, just so impressed with her work. I was like, wow, she is, she yeah. is she is incredibly talented. Uh, she's doing this kind of crime noir thing, but the writing yeah. is like, it's not, you know, sometimes people when they're doing the crime noir, like mm -hmm. I have to strip the writing down to this kind of bare minimum. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, it's not beautiful. It's plot, 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 you know? Yeah. And she's got these just incredible yeah. characters and, and some really profound moments. And I was, I was very impressed by her. Yeah. yeah she reminds me a lot of Stephen Barnes. Oh yeah. I could see that. Yeah. In her style, in her subject choices, in the way she writes, I, I wouldn't be surprised to find that she's she's followed his career. A Barnes fan, yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, and then um, next one up is the newest. It's not Shishin Lu, but it's some other guy writing in the Three Body Problem universe. Oh, really? Yeah, and so I'm. I, that's that's next in queue, and I'm very interested to see how that goes. I I started. Re I loved the th that trilogy. Like, oh god, you <laughs> recommended it to me, and yeah. I loved it so much. And then I read <laughs> um, Ball Lightning, and I I just couldn't get into it as much. It was not as good. So I'm really excited about getting back into that universe. Yeah, I didn't read that one. I read um, Supernova Era, which was a. Uh, it was interesting. It wasn't as good, but the uh, the main. The conceit of that one is that we spot, you know, there's a supernova. And so the gamma wave burst is coming at us. And for reasons that are kind of, you know, we're just going to go with it. Yeah. Uh, anybody under, I think, the age of nine is going to survive. Interesting. And everybody over is going to die. So for the first half of the book, we're getting ready for it. And it's, uh, you know, the way that Leo writes, there's often a lot of social experimentation going on. Yeah. So we're seeing how different countries are preparing. And then afterwards, we see how how it works out. A for, world um, of nine-year-olds and below. Yeah, in this kind of Lord of the Flies-ish kind yeah. of thing. It's very, very interesting. That yeah, you know, you know, I've talked to you about Three Body Problem before. I've, I oh, love yeah. those books so much. My wife forbids me from talking about it in front of her because she's bored <laughs> yeah. hearing me talk about these oh, books. Oh, yeah. No, the, the, they are. If, if folks have not read those, they will. I mean, it is it is. Yeah. I know it sounds like hyperbole. They'll change your life. Like they yeah. change the way you perceive your place in the universe uh, in this yeah. really profound way. I, I love those books. Uh, so yeah, yeah, my pitch on this is, and I, th I think I probably pitched them to you the same way. Like, first of all, the book opens. It's it's set right about now. The book opens with us finding out that the physicists performing primary research are beginning to kill themselves. So what did they just find out? <laughs> right. Yep. <laughs> and. Over three books, which cover six million years, we discover what they found out and the consequences of what they found out. Yeah. And it blows your mind. And on top of that, Shishin Liu is, um, I assume um, our listeners are guessing, is Chinese. He's a Chinese national, grew up in China with Chinese folklore, Chinese storytelling, Chinese narrative structure. Yeah. And so it's not only really good science fiction, but to Western readers like us, it is surprising science fiction because it goes way off the rails that we have come to expect reading western science fiction for so long well and i admit in my ignorance i have not read enough uh, uh you know stories folklore uh chinese folklore to know like is he kind of breaking the rules of chinese narrative structure or is this a good example and so as i was reading i was wondering that a lot like is this because it's it is not the you know the the hero's journey pattern that I have been no. exposed to a billion times, and so I was wondering, like as I was reading it, is this a nat more natural pattern in China, or is this very unusual there? And I don't know enough about uh, Chinese sci-fi to to know, or you know Chinese fantasy or whatever. I'm not I, a I scholar on more. that. I'm not a scholar, but it definitely follows not necessarily narrative structure, but narrative sensibilities. Yeah. Um. And then also there's there's some subversiveness to it based on the current regime. And, you know, I don't want to do any spoilers, but some of the ways he describes certain s future societies. Yeah. I well, wonder I how about he that got too. away with that. Me too. I wondered about that. Like, uh, you know, as I was reading it, I was going, how? Because it's... Yeah. Uh, he know, is dissing uh, on socialism hard right. at one point. It's yeah. like, how, did, how are you still alive, buddy? Yeah, that, and I I did wonder like how did this yeah. kind of slip by? And at the same time, it's mm -hmm. so good that it yeah. could have been you know we want to show this off to the world. Like this is really yeah. And so to be able yeah. to write a book that is that wonderful that you got yeah. like we don't like this, but you know we do want to show mm -hmm. showcase you. It's like an Olympic athlete who you know uh, sneers at the government, but you're like, but we do want their gold medal. Like he yeah. is, <laughs> he's writing he it is that. that. Yeah. So he yeah, is, check him. He out. is there, Neil Stevenson, yeah. and. Yeah, it's uh, if you're a science fiction fan, this is to, what's to read. Yeah. And if you're not, uh, maybe give it a try anyway. Yeah, it, 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 it really might good. be challenging if you're if you're yeah. you know not into sci-fi. But I I push yourself mm. on that one. Yeah. Well, I've been reading far more accessible, but also an absolute s ton of fun. Uh, John Scalzi, lots of John. Oh. Scalzi. Yeah, and I love. Scalzi. I'm having so much, and so I'm in the old man's war. Uh, uh, oh, 
series. So and I don't normally read series that are six books long. Like normally that would be, you know, but yeah. I didn't know it was six books long. I picked up the trilogy and I was mm. like, oh, this is really great. And then I was like, oh, there are three more. Okay. I'm, 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 you know, pot committed now. Like I'm, you know, going to yeah. continue and uh, I've been thoroughly enjoying those. So I've got a couple to go and yeah. Re those are really well, fun. Have you read, um, the two books that you wrote that I liked the most were um, Red Shirts. I have not read Red Shirts. Are you familiar with what it is? Uh, yes, which I think oh, is, yeah. yes. Uh, Do the audiobook because Will Wheaton is the, oh, is really? the narrator. <laughs> I have read and The this, Emperor. What's The Emperor trilogy? Oh, um, I don't know that one. Really good. The Last Emperor <laughs> is one of them. Uh, but yeah. The other one is uh, the, the Android's Dream. Oh, no, I'll have to check that out. It's a standalone and it's it's delightful and it's the the name it's just very, very funny. For example, yeah. they're they're chasing a breed of sheep called the Android's Dream, and somebody just tosses it off. Yeah, I think it's a reference to some old movie. <laughs> nice. um, and that's the only thing they mention. Uh and it opens with a guy who's you know multi civilization, Star Trek, multi species, galactic civilization. A human who's just really good at being empathetic with aliens. And is the guy who goes and delivers bad news because he can do it well. And he, it opens with him outside an embassy with the people inside not letting him in because the amb ambassador doesn't want to hear whatever he's coming to tell him. Yeah. And that. <laughs> uh, his most recent is uh, the Kaiju Preservation Society. And I'm yes. like, that's I'm one of those ones that. where the title just is the yeah. pitch. Hey, I've written yeah. a book called the Kaiju Preservation Society. Okay, can we throw money at you now? Like, yes. <laughs> you know, that's it. That was like, that's yeah. a great conceit yeah. right away. So that, that one fun. I will have to check out as well. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we will have all of your contacts that we mentioned in the uh, show notes. Um, Got to thank a couple of people before we sign off. Thanks to the mm -hmm. artist Max Oakland, who reached out and provided one of his songs for our intro, I Prefer the Dusk. Let Max know you like it by following him on Twitter at Max Oakland with three Ds. Uh, thanks to Halizna CCO for their song Kids for the ad break. If you're in a band and would like your song used on the show, I would love to highlight a listener's work like Max's song. So email that to me. Uh, thanks to Doug, the producer, as always, for making the show sound good and taking the blame when it doesn't. Thank you very much, Doug. We appreciate that. I uh, cannot forget to mention Writers Not Writing is a production of Not A Pie Publishing, so please go to notapiepublishing.com and check out the amazing books written by writers who didn't procrastinate too much. If you like this show, rate and review it wherever you found it. Please check out Jason's newest book, The Safest Family on the Block. Tell a friend about it and rate and review. Those, those five stars make a difference. So click on that fifth star, write a short review, make Jason's day. Uh, and then if you... Uh, have time please smash the like button on this show hey I, I can't even say it I, I tried i tried it still sounds wrong please gently tap the like button for this show as well uh and uh uh th 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 that, that would be much appreciated there's somebody out there who is uh there are two people who are mm -hmm. always going through and disliking you know down arrowing all of the youtube versions of this show and everyone has a right to their opinion but this person is obsessed whoever they are or, you know, whichever two people they are. So please uh, click that thumbs up. It is actually really helpful to kind of counterbalance whoever really hates the show so much that they keep coming back to express their ire. Um, it's probably just some conservative snowflake. You can't handle what you're saying. I, I think so. I'm, that is my assumption and I could be wrong. Maybe they just hate bald people or bearded people or I or, don't know what. How many people have you given an F in class? It lately? very well could be. Yeah. Some student <laughs> who didn't do well in my class and they're like, this is my revenge. Every week I'm going to go back and I'm going to down arrow this show. And I'm like, uh, so yeah, well, you know, who, who knows an ex-girlfriend it's possible. Um, so who's <laughs> just like meh but i'm like well so if you and if you're here and you've made it to the end of the show click that thumbs up we would appreciate it um and then as we go into this next week jason and i want you to remember three things so jason what's your advice for everybody for this week oh um let me see let me see put me on the spot just a little bit but i got i'm you know i'm a dad i give advice without any um <laughs> any propagation whatsoever but since it's the beginning of the summer, um, and I'm the safety guy, brush up on your water safety. Um, whether that's making sure that you drink a little less when you throw a pool party with kids there, whether it's you go take a swimming lesson, or you go make sure that you have enough life jackets. Just you know, brush up on your water safety. Yeah, stay hydrated. Uh, yeah. 
Mine is uh, broader uh, in life as in writing. It's the spaces between the words that make it all meaningful. So don't ignore the spaces. Oh, and, you listen to jazz, don't you? Huh? You listen to jazz. No, don't I you? don't actually. I don't <laughs> enjoy jazz. Yeah, that's that the is, kind of thing a jazz does. It did sound say. a little jazzy. Yeah. I have to change that. Yeah. Uh, it's between the notes that gets you. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I, I can't, I just can't appreciate jazz properly. I, I, I really, it's not a, it's not jazz's fault that I don't like jazz. It's clearly my fault that I don't like jazz. I'm not, I'm not, you know, sensitive. I feel about really. jazz and Aikido the same way that I think it says something bad about me that I don't like either of them. Well, it's the uh, same thing. You know, I've got friends who are really into like fish. And, you know, some of the, those jam bands. And I'm like, mm -hmm. if I knew enough about music, I'm sure I would appreciate. No, no, no. If you knew enough about marijuana. Yes. Both. You would like those If bands. I had, you know, a, a marijuana and LSD habit and was an incredibly yeah. talented musician, this would yeah. absolutely be the band for me. But well, you know what the, the Grateful Dead fan things. said when he ran out of drugs, right? What? Jesus, music sucks. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, no comment, deadheads. Uh, <laughs> third, no matter how much you procrastinate, we're proud of you. Yay. If I take my time.